this work has been done uh, on a summer internship uh, at Google Brain, and this is a joint work with Łukasz Kaiser and Afros uh, Mohudin. Uh, and uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, how to use transformers to optimize uh, hyperparameters of other transformers and also other deep learning architectures. So first, uh, let's consider what sorts of hyperparameters we have to usually deal with uh, in deep learning. So we have uh, obvious things like the learning rate, also we have uh, various parameters of uh, uh, regularization methods like the dropout rate uh, and in adaptive optimizers we have things like moment decays and also in other paradigms like unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning we have all sorts of other hyperparameters and those hyperparameters are very important you need to tune them really well in order for your uh, architecture to achieve optimal performance uh, but it is also a hard problem. There are no a priori uh, known rules uh, how to choose those uh, hyperparameters. And what we usually end up doing is just choosing them by trial and error. Uh, so this takes really a lot of time. Um, so if you are trying to beat the state of the art on some task, then usually uh, many people are uh, running uh, very many experiments in order to get those hyperparameters just right. So there is a big need for automatic uh, methods. Uh, especially because usually this hyperparameter tuning needs to be redone for every new architecture and task. Uh, also, some hyperparameters, um, it makes sense to change them over the course of, uh, of training. Uh, so use some hyperparameter schedules. And so this is, um, this is an example uh, test accuracy plot of the white ResNet uh, architecture and also just the regular uh, ResNet on the CIFAR-10 dataset. Um, so we can see here uh, the test accuracy uh, plot and also the learning rate schedule. So those numbers over here are the learning rates set at, um, at various time periods of the training. So we start with a big uh, learning rate and then we uh, drop it five times after the 60th uh, epoch. Then we drop it again at 120th epoch and again after uh, at the 160th uh, epoch. And every time, that we drop the learning rate, uh, our test accuracy, uh, our, sorry, this is test error, uh, our test error suddenly drops, um, and then it keeps decreasing, decreasing, uh, then it plateaus, then it drops again after we uh, change the learning rate, and so on. So picking those exact points at which we need to uh, drop the learning rate, and also by how much, uh, yeah, requires a lot of effort. So as I said, there is a need for automatic methods. Uh, and there already are some, uh, some methods to do that. Um, there are very simple ones like grid search, or random search. There are more sophisticated and, and more data efficient ones like Bayesian optimization. There are also more uh, parallelizable ones like evolutionary algorithms. But uh, those algorithms have a number of problems. First, uh, they are typically not learnable. So you typically uh, cannot transfer the knowledge learned by tuning one architecture to another. Um, also, typically, uh, the hyperparameters are fixed during training, so the uh, optimization algorithm picks some values of hyperparameters and then keeps them constant uh, throughout training of our model. <coughs> and those, those methods typically cannot uh, benefit from uh, observing how the training process progresses to, uh, uh, to tune our hyperparameters adaptively during training. Um, so to solve all of those issues, we thought, why not use reinforcement learning? Um, so the setting would be like this. Let's learn a policy that we will then use to control hyperparameters uh, of our model based on the current values of the observed validation metrics. Um, so, doing so, we can train uh, our policy on a wide range of architectures and tasks. I mean, we can also uh, train on just one, but we can also try to uh, make our policy more robust. And then we can uh, perform 
either zero shot or few uh, shot transfer to new architectures and tasks to transfer the knowledge that we gained on those other tasks. So by zero shot transfer, I mean uh, take a general policy and then deploy it on a new task. And few shot uh, means that this policy may uh, use some, mm, <coughs> some additional data for uh, the task at hand um, to, to fine tune it. Um, so a long-term uh, vision of this project is to uh, create a general system that is robust enough to tune any new architecture or, uh, on any new task. Um, and then we could open source uh, those, poli uh, those controller policies so that everyone, all uh, ML practitioners, can use them, uh, which would greatly accelerate the process of uh, research and deployment of uh, machine learning architectures because uh, we don't have to tune them manually anymore. Um, so let's try to frame the problem of hyperparameter optimization as an reinforcement learning problem. So in reinforcement learning, the usual setting is that we have an agent that interacts with the environment, <coughs> and it gets some rewards from the environment and tries to optimize the uh, cumulative sum of the rewards. Um, so our agent observes some data from the environment. So in our case, this will be the current values of the validation metrics. Uh, and then the, uh, the, action, uh, the agent decides on one, what action to take in, uh, to uh, influence the environment to change its state. Then the environment uh, gives the agent a reward. Ah, OK, yeah, and in our case, the, the actions would be the hyperparameter changes. So based on that, the environment changes its state and it uh, outputs a reward to an agent. And in our case, uh, the reward would be a change in some chosen, hyper, uh, in some chosen validation metrics, such as uh, the accuracy, uh, since the last training step. So that if we sum up all of the rewards gained throughout the training of the model, we arrive uh, at the final value of our chosen metric, which we want to optimize for. Um, so some important features of, um, of this problem is that uh, it is a partially observable uh, environment. So we do not know the whole uh, state of the environment of our model training, because that would need to encompass uh, all of the uh, parameter values of our neural network. And this is just too much. Uh, so because of that, our uh, environment is uh, non-deterministic because we don't have the, have the whole information. Uh, and the sources of, um, of stochasticity in this environment are uh, random weight initialization, the permutation of the data set, and possibly other things. Um, so let's talk about the tasks that we benchmark our method. Uh, we will benchmark our method on. So we have uh, two language modeling data sets. Uh, so this task is about predicting a uh, next word in a sequence, in a sentence. Um, and for this, we will tune a transformer language model on the LM1B data set, which has uh, one billion words. And also uh, on the Pen Tree Bank dataset, uh, which is much smaller, it has several million words. Um, and we will also tune Transformer on a translation dataset, WMT English to German translation. Mm. And to show that it doesn't only work with Transformers, uh, we will also tune the White ResNet uh, architecture on a CIFAR 10 classification dataset. So, as Transformer is the central tool in our approach, let me talk about that a little bit. Um, so, who has previously used Transformer? Please raise your hand. Wow, a lot of people, yes. Uh, so, Transformer is uh, relatively new. It has like two years. Uh, State-of-the-art uh, architecture in various um, natural language processing tasks, such as language modeling and translation. Um, so, in the general uh, form, transformer uh, is a model for sequence trans uh, transduction, so translating from one sequence to another. Mm. But we will uh, consider only a version of transformer for language modeling, so it 
does not have the encoder, it just has the decoder, mm, and it does not have this uh, layer uh, merging the uh, data processed by the encoder and the decoder, so it's, uh, it's much simpler. And in this form, uh, uh, the central building block of transformer is the self-attention layer, which uh, basically, uh, for each point of the sequence, creates an, uh, a softmax uh, mask uh, on the previous tokens in the sequence, and then computes a weighted sum of the features at those uh, tokens according to this mask. So for more details about Transformer, uh, I, uh, I recommend the paper in which Transformer was uh, uh, introduced. It's Attention is All You Need, uh, 2017. Mm -hmm. And one important thing uh, about uh, Transformer that um, is one of the reasons which is, uh, why it is so widely used is that uh, it allows a massive parallelization. Um, so unlike the previous state-of-the-art methods, it does not any, uh, have any recurrent connections. It just has those self-attention layers, which allows it, uh, allows it to uh, be parallelized very efficiently on modern uh, hardware accelerators such as uh, GPUs. Um, <coughs> And let's talk about, a bit about what hyperparameters we are going to tune in those models. Uh, so for the transformer tasks, we will tune the learning rate and the weight decay rate. And also we will uh, tune various dropouts in various layers. And for wide ResNet, we are going to tune the learning rate, the weight decay rate, and the momentum mass in stochastic gradient descent with nestor of momentum. So first, let's try to uh, apply a very uh, widely used model-free reinforcement learning uh, algorithm, which is, <coughs> which is proximal policy uh, optimization. Uh, so as I said, it is a, a very widely used algorithm for various uh, reasons. First, it is uh, a more sample-efficient method than just vanilla uh, policy gradient. Uh, <coughs> But it is also uh, very stable, so that um, when we run the, the algorithm um, multiple times, it will almost always, at, at least for, uh, for most problems, uh, converge at a good solution at some point, sometimes earlier, sometimes later. And we are going to use the transformer language model without the input uh, embedding as a policy. So we strip this layer so that our transformer uh, can accept continuous input. So it doesn't operate on a sequence of symbols anymore, but on a sequence of some, uh, uh, some real vectors. And the setup of the experiment is that we are going to be using, uh, we are going to be optimizing for the accuracy on a, a held out validation set. So we divide the training set into, um, <clears throat> into two chunks, and one of them will be used just for uh, validation. And we are going to run uh, 20 uh, epochs of PPO. And in each epoch of PPO, we are going to train 128 models, so either transformers of, uh, or wide resnets, and then use the collected data to perform the PPO updates. And it takes around three hours for uh, each model training, but we are doing this in parallel. So, uh, so it, it takes around 60 hours for uh, the whole experiment, 20 times three. And those are the results, and the results uh, are not great for this model-free method. Um, so, as we can see, uh, there is... Uh, okay, so first, what those plots mean. So this is, um, this is an accuracy plot on a given task for the final policy obtained after the PPO training. And on the x-axis, we have the training step of our model. And on the y-axis, we have the uh, final test accuracy. <coughs> um, and you can see here uh, a mean over four runs of our experiment. This is the... Um, 
This is the bold green curve. But we also uh, see the minimum and maximum performance uh, uh, in those experiments. So the experiment was run in four repetitions for, for each task. And then we can see the minimum, maximum, and mean on this uh, plot. So we can see that the PPO learned policy uh, consistently uh, converges faster. So like the initial stages of training are, are just faster. But it doesn't, um, it doesn't achieve the same final performance uh, as the, as a, as the uh, manually tuned baseline. Um, so, um, and we can also see that there is a lot of variance between the runs uh, of the experiment. So sometimes we see that, uh, that the policy actually exceeds the baseline, but it doesn't do that all the time, and sometimes it is uh, very poor. Uh, so um, the exception is the wide rest net task, which is uh, probably just easy for our method, uh, where we uh, exceed the, ba the baseline right away. Um, so, as I said earlier, uh, it takes around three hours to do a training of a single model. And it is crucial to, um, to perform the, uh, the update sequentially, so we cannot try to uh, train 2000, um, 20 times more models, but in the same PPO epoch, so it all uh, takes just three hours. It is, crucial to have this uh, sequential update. Mm. <coughs> so we could, in principle, try to uh, uh, train PPO forever and then arrive at a very good policy, but in practice we cannot do that because we have, uh, uh, we have limited resources both computation-wise and time-wise. So let's think about how to speed up this algorithm. So the idea that we have, uh, we had was to use a model-based reinforcement learning approach. Mm. So in this approach, um, we will try to um, learn an auxiliary model that will try to predict the uh, learning dynamics of the architecture that we are training, and then use this predictive model to uh, train the policy uh, instead of using real data. So the concrete approach that we are using is simulated policy learning, or SIMPLE in short, introduced in the work model-based reinforcement learning for Atari 2019. Um, and this approach has two elements. First, uh, we have the policy that takes as input uh, a sequence of observations and outputs a, a probability distribution over the next action to take. And we have this so-called word model, so the predictive model of, uh, of learning dynamics, that takes as input um, a sequence of observations and the last action performed by the, by the agent, and now puts a probability distribution over the next observation. So, uh, so our whole uh, training process will look like like, uh, like usual in reinforcement learning, except we substitute uh, our uh, simulated environment for the real environment. And the environment predicts the observation, the agent out outputs the action, and then we fit it into the, uh, uh, into the word model, and so on and so on. Uh, so this algorithm is iterative we are going to uh, first collect uh, data on the real environment using our current policy and then use this data to train the model. And then we are going to uh, run a bunch of uh, updates with simulated experience uh, on our policy. And this method is much more sample uh, efficient than uh, vanilla PPO because we are heavily use using the simulated experience instead of the real one. So this is a conceptual graph uh, of how the algorithm works. So we start with some policy, which initially is just random. We collect some trajectories, so we train some deep learning architectures uh, using this policy. Um, then we uh, train our word model on this collected data. And we use this uh, word model to improve 
our policy. Now our policy is better, so it uh, trains our uh, architectures better, so it collects better data, so we can train our model on better data, and so on and so on. It iteratively improves. Um, so let's now think a bit about how we are going to use, uh, how we are going to model uh, our uh, environment, so how we are going to uh, model deep learning dynamics. So first, uh, as I said before, uh, our environment is, um, is non-deterministic, uh, and it is uh, composed of several uh, time series. So we will we'll have uh, a single time series for um, all of the metrics that we are uh, going to observe. So in our case, we are uh, fitting into the policy the validation accuracy, validation loss, also training accuracy and training loss. So our environment uh, consists of those. Uh, form time series, and each time step is those four numbers. So usually when we are trying to model time series, uh, we are using the autoregressive factorization. So we say that the probability of the whole sequence is the probability of the first element times the probability of the second element given the first, uh, and so on and so on. And in each step of the sequence, we predict the next point uh, based on the history of all previously uh, predicted points. Um, so uh, th there is one question that we need to ask ourselves. Uh, how to define this conditional distribution of the next point given the previous ones? So a common approach is to use a parametric distribution, for example, uh, just a, a Gaussian, uh, with uh, the mean controlled by our neural network and with the variance fixed. This is a common approach. But it has a number of issues. Um, it, is, um, it is quite inflexible because we have to choose the, uh, the shape of our distribution. And if our data does not fit uh, this shape, then we cannot model our data uh, accurately. So. Another approach that we were considering in this work um, is to not model the continuous sequence at all, uh, not try to do that. Um, instead, we are uh, discretizing our continuous sequence using a fixed point representation. So we end up with, uh, with a sequence of digits in this uh, fixed point representation which we can then uh, try to predict using a, a discrete uh, sequence modeling uh, model, for example, the transformer. So as an example, if we have our time series over here, so x1, x2, etc., uh, then we uh, represent those numbers in a fixed point representation. So in this example, we are using six bits for, uh, for every number in the series. And then we pack those bits together into chunks of length three uh, on this example. And we say that each of uh, such ch chunks is a symbol in our sequence. So in this example, we are uh, using two to the third equals eight symbols. And we run our uh, language modeling uh, architecture on the sequence of those symbols. So we try to predict this symbol based on those symbols. Uh, so our model outputs a, prob a categorical probability distribution over the next symbol, and then we sample from this distribution, then we feed it back to the model, and so on, and so on, and so on. So this way, we can model any distribution. We are not um, constrained to any shape uh, of, a, of, the, of a distribution, just up to a certain precision. So instead of being restricted to one shape of a distribution, we are now restricted to a given precision. We cannot uh, model anything uh, with better precision. Mm. So let's uh, look at some uh, results on a synthetic uh, data set. So we created this uh, data set uh, to look similar um, as uh, real-world training curves. So those are, uh, so those are curves that start at zero and converge to one uh, asymptotically 
at some different rates. So this data set is composed of uh, curves of, uh, of such form with various rates of convergence to one. And we can see here uh, how this data uh, is reproduced. So uh, we train a, a, a time series model on this data and then try to generate, uh, uh, generate curves that look similar using this model. Um, and you can see that uh, with our discretization method, we are able to uh, reproduce the exact shape of those curves, as well as the diversity in those different curves. So we are uh, able to, uh, to predict uh, curves at, of various rates of convergence. But using this uh, very simple uh, Gaussian uh, distribution as, the, as a um, <coughs> as a distribution of, over the next element in the series, we see that um, the curves generated by the model collapse to a single shape. So this is uh, not a good approach in, uh, in this case. So we are going to use this discretization method from now on, and let's think about how to use the transformer as a full uh, word model. So the only piece missing is uh, how to input the actions from the policy uh, to our model. So we are uh, going to model a very long sequence, a discrete sequence uh, using our model, and it will uh, be composed of observations uh, and actions from the agent interleaved. So we have observation one, then action one, observation two, action two, and so on and so on. And during training of the model, we are going to input this whole sequence, and we are going to predict just the observations. So in the loss function, uh, the actions will be mas masked out because we are not trying to predict them using the model. Uh, the loss will only come from, the, from predicting the observations. And we are going to calculate the rewards. So uh, as a reminder, the uh, reward is a relative change in some uh, given validation metric since the last, last time step. So we are going to deterministically calculate the rewards based on the last two observations generated by the model. And let's see how this works in practice. So those are example uh, training curves from uh, White ResNet on CIFAR 10. And uh, the blue line is the training accuracy uh, curve of a real model Control, with hyperparameters controlled by our uh, current policy. And the green curve, which is maybe not so visible, uh, sorry about that, um, is a curve predicted by our, our word model. So we can see here that our word model is able to reproduce the rough uh, shape of the, uh, of the curve. Uh, it is able to predict when the, uh, the accuracy suddenly in increases, when it suddenly decreases, it, yeah, it, it follows the, the shape pretty well. Um, it cannot predict exactly always uh, by how much the accuracy increases or decreases, but it is also not uh, possible to, to predict that accurately because, as I said, those curves are stochastic. Um, and also, crucially for us, uh, it is able to re reproduce the final uh, accuracy of the model pretty well, uh, which is very important because that's where our reward signal for the policy uh, comes from. So let's look at some numbers um, of how much we gain by using those word models instead of uh, training real architectures. So it takes under a minute sample 128 episodes using our word model. And in comparison, it takes, as I said, uh, three hours, so let's say just uh, over one hour, uh, to train one real architecture. So using the word model is at least 128 times 60, which is over 7,000 times faster. So we get a massive speed up. Uh, and so we can uh, train our policy much, much faster. And so, um, 
And also, uh, there is one more important detail about how we are uh, uh, how we are using to train our policy in uh, in the model-based uh, approach. So we are going to share the architecture between the word model and the policy. So now uh, we reintroduce the input embeddings to the policy, so that the policy also takes uh, discrete uh, input. Uh, yeah. So the input is going to be the same as for the word model. Um, and the output is going to be the action distribution and the value estimate used in PPO. And we will pre-initialize uh, uh, the parameters of our policy using the parameters of a trained word model. So uh, we are going to start with some initial data set of trajectories, uh, which we are going to train the word model uh, on. And then we are going to... Uh, to transfer those, the parameters of the train word model to the policy and then run the regular PPO training from this uh, initial point in the parameter space. So this empirically leads to much faster learning because we start with this well-chosen uh, point in the parameter space and then we run the, the PPO updates. And the experiment setup uh, here is that we again uh, optimize for the accuracy on a held out set. As I said, we, uh, we are starting from a data set of some initial trajectories collected in the PPO experiments mentioned earlier. So there will be a little a bit over 10K trajectories. And we are going to run 10 uh, epochs of simple. And in, we, in each uh, epoch of simple, we are going to run 50 uh, PPO epochs on the simulated experience. And again, we, um, in each data gathering phase, uh, we are running 128 parallel model trainings. Uh, and it takes uh, around three hours to train uh, the, the architecture that we are tuning, around one hour for model training on the collected data, around two hours for policy training on the simulated experience. And so uh, adding all of this together, it takes around 60 hours for the entire experiment. So, yep, true. 60. 60. Yes, so uh, in each simple epoch, you run uh, data gathering, which takes three hours plus one hour, two hour. Yeah. 60. So let's see the results of our model based method. And the results are much better now. Um, so the blue curve, which is new on those plots, um, is the performance of the policy trained use, using simple. And we can see that on some tasks, uh, this policy gets consistently better results than our baseline. Uh, in some tasks, it matches the, the, the performance uh, quite accurately. But in all, uh, in all tasks, uh, the architecture uh, with hyperparameters tuned by our policy converges faster and even faster than the PPO controlled one. Uh, and also we can see that, uh, that there is significantly lower variance between the runs of the algorithm compared to the, to the uh, PPO experiments. And here is the table of the final performance of all of the uh, evaluated methods. So, on some tasks, uh, the simple policy achieves uh, significantly higher performance than, uh, than the baseline, so LM1B and CIFAR10, and on other tasks, it, uh, it achieves very similar performance. But as I, uh, as I said, we get faster convergence, so we are doing something better. Um, and here are um, some examples of uh, hyperparameter schedules uh, learned by our policies, but I'm not going to talk about that because uh, we don't have time for this, unfortunately. Um, so to, summary, uh, to summarize, um, using word models in some cases, for example in this case, uh, allows much faster training and allows us to uh, achieve better policies in the time budget that we have. Um, and this is one of the first successful practic practical uh, applications of model-based RL. So model-based RL is widely used in robotics. 
Um, and there it achieved some successes, but uh, this is like a new application in which uh, those methods can help us. So that's nice. And the amount of data that we uh, currently need is around 11,000 model trainings, which is a lot. Uh, it is comparable to the first work on, on neural ar architecture search, then those methods uh, were uh, improved, so they don't need s such a lot of data anymore. So there is some work needed to decrease this number, and this is what we are going to do next. So uh, an idea to, uh, about how to decrease the data requirements of uh, our pipeline is to use transfer. So get a very big reservoir of data collected, uh, training various uh, models and architectures, uh, architectures on various tasks, and then train a, a general word model that is able to predict uh, uh, learning dynamics of various architectures, um, and then use it for transfer to, to train new architectures and tasks. Another uh, idea for future work is to uh, do some model predictive control using the uh, model, because uh, in practice, in our experiments, we found that we need to increase uh, the entropy of our policy significantly in order to, for it to uh, collect diverse experience so we can train our model well. But maybe it doesn't make so much sense to use this exploratory policy uh, to do uh, actual hyperparameter uh, tuning where we care about the final performance of the model the most. So we can try to use some planning methods to, uh, to do better. And also, uh, I only shown the results on supervised learning tasks, but it seems that uh, adaptive hyperparameter tuning can help us the most in uh, settings that are notoriously unstable, such as uh, unsupervised learning or reinforcement learning, where um, if our training process uh, destabilizes at some point, then uh, we often cannot uh, recover from that. So we can try to deal with that uh, using uh, adaptive hyperparameter tuning. So thank you very much uh, for your attention.